um, progress monitoring, monitoring in mathematics. And that will be Miss Stephanie Kidd providing that session for us. I'm gonna turn that over to you now, uh, Stephanie. So what's the purpose of mathematics? Of course, number one, it's the law. Uh, it guides our instruction and in making decisions and motivating our students. We do not know what's the next steps if we do not progress monitor. We do not understand if the students are truly getting the instruction and if they're making progress toward a goal. So we need to make sure that we can make instructional changes according to that. And in math, that comes through many different levels. We'll talk today about um, our standards for math practice and why they are so important. So in progress monitoring, number one, it's the law, we have to do it. Number two is it informs us on how to make instructional decisions. And another thing is, if our students see that they're making progress and you can graph that out for our students many times, it's very motivating for them. The other thing is, what do I know about what my students is learning for the go? So that's a question I need to ask. These are the whys, Why, what do I want to know? So if I'm thinking about what does my student need to know, and then that's going to get me started with what's the next steps. And then what do I want to learn about my students' skill level and their understanding? One of the things about progress monitoring for special ed many times is it's done with us sitting beside of the student. And this is so important because if we're sitting beside that student, we can have those questions of what are you thinking? Um, that's one of my favorite. And if a student's really shy about starting out that way, my first question that I always ask is, what do you see? If they're worried about moving on or they can't, what do you see? Because I can't be wrong about what I see. And that will get me talking about this is the, you know, this would be the next thing I would do. And that helps. Another thing is, what data or information do I need to answer those questions? So what is some information that I need for my student to know what's my next level that they're going to be at and where are they at currently at? So if I'm looking, here's some why questions. One, why is the student not meeting the academic standard? And in our case, why is my student not meeting that goal? The other thing is, why is the student not accessing the content? Is there something that's blocking him from being able to access that content? Is it their understanding? Is it that we didn't go through the complete CSA model, which means I started with concrete, moved to semi-concrete and then to abstract? Is it because my student's not able to compare and contrast and they're not able to see what's there, including numbers? If I've got a student who's dyslexic, many times they can't compare and contrast. So we need to look at how can I make sure that they're actually getting the number itself? And then why is the student not meeting the functional standards? So we have to look at what are functional standards in mathematics, and you'll see those most of the time in the overviews. And then, of course, why is the student not engaged in grade level mathematics? The cool thing about math is it is a progression. We build upon each other. Each time that we do something, we're building up on something that was previously there. Our math standards are set up to where it is beautifully done to where you can click on the little coherence button. You can see how it's vertically aligned, and you can also see how it's aligned within the standards of that grade level. So if it's connected to something, so you can teach two standards at one time. I love that for our standards, and I really love the fact that during that time, I can look and see where does the student need to know next, and maybe what do I need to go back and teach. So that progression that we have in our academic standards, and of course you can find that at kystandards.org, uh, you can see how to uh, maneuver that student and really get their goals more grade appropriate and also level appropriate for that student. Uh, what does that uh, teaching method not impacting my students? Some teaching methods that we have don't impact our students as well as others do. So if that student is a kinetic learner and they need to move around, or if that student is a visual learner, so they need graphic organizers, what are those materials that's going to help impact that student the most? And then of course, why does the group size impact the student learning? If that student has issues with being able to pay attention, Group size is important for, for our kids. Maybe they need small group. Maybe they need station teaching. Sometimes they just need to be in proximity to the teacher so they're paying attention. 
Uh, also, is there sounds that's going on in the background that may change how the student's learning? And then does the analysis go beyond impairment criteria? So we need to look at all of those things. Okay, so our math teaching practices that we're going to look at, this comes from NCTM, which is the National Council for Teaching Mathematics. These are the teaching practices that we want to make sure that we're working with. And I'm going into a lot of these today just because it's going to guide how you do your instruction. And also that instruction, how we change it in mathematics to get to our progress monitoring. Now, first of all, we need to establish mathematical goals and to focus that learning. That's one of the key points of an IEP is to create those goals based on our present levels. So if we look at where that child is, what's a goal that they can truly reach within one year? And then how are we gonna implement the task that promotes those understandings in mathematics? And that's usually reasoning and, pro and problem solving. We're also gonna look at building fluency. For many times in our in the KY standards, you'll see in the very back section, I think it's 258, there's a fluency chart for each grade level and where they need to be, such as kindergarten is adding and subtracting within five. And then uh, first grade is adding and subtracting within 10. And second grade is adding and subtracting within 20. And then third grade changes over to multiplication. And then of course, doing addition and subtraction with some uh, strategies, not with the algorithm, which we end up talking about later. Um, but there's fluency standards for each grade level. So are we going to build on a fluency standard? Are we going to build on problem solving? Are we going to build on reasoning? Those are the questions that we have to ask ourselves in mathematics when we're going to progress monitor. And it may change the way that you progress monitor in mathematics. So the next questions that we're going to get into after we've done, after we've chosen whether it's going to be reasoning, problem solving, or fluency, we're going to we're going to pose those que purposeful questions. We're going to look at that and we're going to say, okay, what's good questions that I can ask the student to make sure that it's focusing on the goal. And then I'm going to use all my connections and math representation. Again, talking about that CSA model, I'm going to provide concrete uh, manipulatives. I'm going to make sure that they have something they can maneuver and they can see the math actually working. And then I'm gonna provide semi-concrete, which means I'm going to make sure that the student is able to draw out the map. And if I provide all of these things and I'm not seeing progressions at this point, what do I need to add? What do I, how do I need a scaffold so that that student reaches his goal? And we're gonna to scaffold to the goal, not just scaffold to the student. And then of course, we're gonna talk about elicit and use the evidence of the student's thinking. I'm going to have that student to talk and then here's a hard part for me, and it always was a hard, I think it's a hard part for anybody who sees a student struggle, but productive struggle is a great thing in mathematics, and we want them to struggle and to question and to understand, and many times our kids don't have the skills to question, which means they're missing a part of the math practices, which is actually being able to argue the math. And so we want them to be able to do that. So we want them to struggle a little bit and to ask questions. Now we're gonna give them feedback during all of this and it's gonna be very important for them, but that's one of the things that we want to make sure that they're doing. Now, the standards for math practices, I think of this as the student math practices. These are the things that we want our students to do. So if I'm looking at these things, have I walked through this to make sure my students had a really good experience and they actually touched on all these things. And sometimes that's really hard for our students to do, but we know that they need each and every one of these to have a good experience with mathematics and to truly understand. So can they make sense of a problem and persevere in solving them? That means they're willing to work through it. They're willing to try another strategy. They're willing to go pick up a manipulative when they need to. And one of the great things about manipulatives is if they're readily available, and I just saw this last week when I was in a, a school, and I won't say the name of the school, but the kids walked in, and like one of the first things they did was went and grabbed their algebra blocks, and they, they pulled them to them, and they were like, okay, we're, we're ready to use these. And they knew that they're working on linear equations, so they, they were ready to, okay, I've got these, I, I can use these, I can work out my problems with them. And if they got stuck, they were willing to ask questions, so that was wonderful to see. Uh, reason abstractly and quantitatively. We want them to reason through problems, and many times that includes drawing out that problem. 
and then construct viable arguments. Like I said before, many times they don't know how to question you to get the answers they need. So we need to model that as much as we can, our thinking itself and working through a problem. So, and then of course, the next one is modeling with mathematics. Now, modeling means I can pick up manipulatives and I can use them. It may be a bead string, it may be unifix cubes, it may be algebra tiles, but whatever they're modeling with that mathematics. And then of course, we want them to use appropriate tools and strategies. So that one's kind of key. We don't pick the tool they use, the student picks the tool. So making sure that they know the tools that go along with some of the things that they're doing and they can pick the appropriate tool. They're not gonna go get a protractor and try to add with it. They're gonna go pick the appropriate tool to do whatever they're needing to use. And then of course, attending to precision it means they're willing to check okay they're willing to check their own answers they're willing to check and, and make sure they're they're on the right path they can this is hard for our students but they're willing to estimate am i in the ballpark so those are some things that the student needs to be willing to do and to think through and then of course look for and make use of structure we want them to understand structure many times graphic organizers are great for this especially later in fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, if we're looking at working with decimals or fractions that they understand what they're supposed to do at that point in time. And if they're using an algorithm. And then of course, look for and express repeated reasoning. This is patterns. Patterns are so hard for our students. And we not only see this with just understanding what number comes next, but when they get into skip counting and with decimals, what's the pattern that they're going to see? And that includes even with when they start talking about square roots and squares, those kind of things, they need to see the patterns that are there. And many times that means that we are teaching them the patterns. Of course, the methods that we're going to use are curriculum based measures. We're going to use direct measures. We're going to use indirect measures and authentic uh, assessments. Those are the things that you're going to have to choose what you're using to address um, the students. Many times we use curriculum based measures, which is probes in mathematics. It's a great way for us to be able to uh, assess our students. We can give them probes and you'll see several of those today when we're working through this. So with probes, I'm going to say it's wonderful for us to be able to use. I am going to say on easy CBM, those are really not, uh, even though they're curriculum based measures, for mathematics, unfortunately, there's multiple things inside of each of the probes. So they end up being something that we can use um, to determine where that student is grade level wise, but, and to write a great uh, present level. They're wonderful for those kind of things, but easy CBM for mathematics, there are too many other variables inside. So if I'm looking for addition, um, they may have some decimals, if, especially if I'm looking like at fifth grade addition. There may be decimals involved, there may be fractions involved in the same probe, and I'm not measuring those kind of things. So I would probably want to look at those and make sure that it really is meeting that goal specific. So that's one of the things. And of course, we, we talk about our direct measures and indirect measures and authentic measures. And what does that need to look like um, with each of these? And if I'm looking at my direct measure, I want to make sure that, you know, it's an assessment, you know, that is student work product, it's got um, performance in it, you can kind of walk through and understand exactly what that student is doing in the mathematics, whereas indirect methods, we've talked about those that include like rubrics and those kind of things. And then of course, you've got authentic, which is your oral interviews that you're going to have with your student. Now, some of those, we're gonna have oral interviews with our students if we're doing side by side because I want to know their thinking. I need to know their thinking. And so, and work samples, of course, are authentic assessments that you may use, such as exit slips and those kind of things that we may pull in at times. Those are wonderful to use. So don't think that every time that we do a assessment in our classroom that we're gonna be pulling those, those in, that's not true. We need to direct our learning, but it may not be the chosen thing for progress monitoring at that time. So a good way to do these um, is go ahead and set up your probes, 
make up 10 or 12 of those. You can reuse those at times. Um, and then what you can do for that is have those conversations as they're going through and then you have your own recording sheet. So that's what I like to, to work on. So let's talk about how do I get that growth goal or the aim line? Let's talk about that aim line. And we have to give three probes and they have to be given, right? And we're going to look at either the median or the mean of those three that we're giving in the baseline. And when I look at those, which one's the better data to determine that child's exact point, the median or the mean? Now, we know that anytime we've given an assessment, that is one point in time for that student. We also need to consider at that point in time what is going on with that student. Did they have a bad morning in the cafeteria before I gave this? Um, did they, are they feeling well? Have they missed three or four days of school? All of those things Chastity had talked about before and had used as part of hers to say, okay, that may be something that's going on. And the reason why that instruction was not as, or that assessment was not as well that day. Keep all of those things in mind. And it's a great way. You've got a note section in Infinite Campus to put those notes in there is the reason why something happened because you can't always go back at the end of the nine weeks and remember, oh, on Thursday, uh, December 5th, yeah, he wasn't doing real well uh, that morning because on the bus he got in trouble and he was upset. Those kind of things happen, but if we go ahead and put in the information on the day that we have taken the assessment or we write a note and we put it in their working folder, then we can go back and actually look at those kind of things and put that in as the reason being for them to maybe not have scored as well. Also, if you see a big jump all of a sudden and you've changed some instructional strategies, make sure you note those too. Now, your growth norm is your proje uh, projected amount of growth that you're going to see. Now, that projected amount of growth, you're going to look at, okay, this child's IQ, their working memory, um, their processing speed, all of those things take into effect. So for many of our students, when I'm thinking about for, uh, growth, if I'm working on within 100%, do I expect them to have a 5% growth every week? Do I expect them to have, which is 0.5? Or do I expect them to have a, maybe a, a a growth, if I'm doing 100 problems, uh, let's click, please don't do 100 problems. If I'm doing 10 problems, that they may get one more problem every two weeks. So those are the kind of things that I want to look for. What's that growth that they're going to have? Most of the time I look at that growth norm as 0.5 or 0.6, somewhere in between there. And then typically your weeks of instruction is typical of 36. So, and that equals your growth goal. Those are the things that I want to make sure that my students are able to do. Now, my graph, what does that graph need to include? The title, baseline, the criteria, uh, of course, the aim line, the trend line that they're going to need, data points with the dates to be included. That's the month, the day, the year, and it must match the frequency in which you have outlined, whether it's twice a month or if it's uh, every week, Whatever that means to be, it must meet that criteria and the goal. And then instructional changes uh, documented on the graph, any kind of instructional changes that you've made. Now, what is our evidence? If we're looking at our evidence here, and we are talking about, of course, in adult notes, we're talking about analyzing student work samples, we're talking about exit slips, um, we may have structured observations. And if you've ever used like running records or those kind of things, those are very structured observations. And then of course you've got interviews, which is again, an authentic assessment. And then if we're looking at the quantitative, we're looking at sc uh, scored student work. We're looking at a rubric. You're doing your unit test, uh, your unit quizzes, which like, again, needs to be aligned with the goal. If it's not, then you're probably not going to use those. And then any kind of global uh, outcome assessments, those are more used for um, your present levels than they are for this. Of course, any math computational probe, which is a CBM, those are wonderful. And then again, running records, we're going to talk about those and how, the, how you can use those in doing probes, work samples, and then teacher-made tests.
a link here for progress monitoring options, and this was during COVID. So if you've got some kids that are virtual, these are some really good activities that you can do for progress monitoring. We'll click on that link. And as you can see, it goes through what work samples. There's a math uh, worksheet generator that's really good for teacher made assessments. And it gives you some good probes that you can set up. You have a math fluency generator. I am going to say this much about math fluency generators. I know that they have the thing of the fact of timed assessments, and that's great for kids to understand that they need to complete in a certain amount of time, but it sets up math anxiety and I shut down. If I can't think of it quickly enough, I will shut down and I won't do the assessment or I'll just go through and do a couple of them. Now, and that may be the only ones I know, like I know plus one. So I go through and do all the ones that has plus one. That really doesn't understand. I really don't get an understanding of how many problems they can complete in a minute if they're jumping all over the page. Uh, so, that really doesn't work for our students really well to be able to know their understanding other than they know all their plus ones. That's all I know at that point. I don't know the strategy in which they use or anything like that. So those are great for if you've got a kid who already, you already know their strategies and those kind of things. But if you, if you don't know that student strategy, you don't know how they're working through the problems, those really are not uh, good ones for you. Of course, check sheets where you're sitting with a student and you're working through and you're making sure that they're organizing up for a task. This is great if they're doing word problems to understand what the student's doing for those word problems. And then, of course, rubrics on the end where if we're looking for a certain criteria score uh, of them completing a word problem, maybe they, they go through all the steps. And so we're using a rubric to, to invest in that. So that's one that we have. The question you have to ask yourself in mathematics is, is your goal a procedural skill, a fluency, conceptual? And again, I went back to procedural. So is it fluency, conceptual, or procedural? Now, in this case, you're going to, of course, use different things to measure that. For fluency goals, you're going to have a very quick uh, probe that's going to be there. You're going to choose if it's going to be one minute or three minutes. Um, you're going to look at, and I wouldn't stop the student, I would just kind of mark where they're at if you're doing fluency and just let them complete and talk to them. The other thing about doing any of these assessments is make sure you're giving corrective feedback right afterwards. And, you know, quick responses, corrective feedback, those are important. And then, of course, if it's conceptual or is it procedural, we're going to look at those and determine what do we need to do about those. So if I was looking at this one and I'm looking at whether it's conceptual or if it is procedural, I'm gonna think about my procedural skills and they're measuring effective strategies, right? I'm looking at the effectiveness of the strategy in which we have been taught. So if I have a student and we're working with the algorithm, are they able to do the algorithm? And if you've looked at your standards, we don't touch that algorithm until fourth grade. So that's where we start talking about the algorithms of addition and subtraction. So making sure that it also fits in with our standards. We're not trying to teach an algorithm in second grade. We don't want that to happen. We want to give them a strategy for them to be able to use and look at that. We're, we're going to look at um, conceptual, which is demonstrating in mathematics when we recognize, we're able to label, um, are we able to do uh, comparing and contrasting? Are they able to interpret graphs? That's conceptual. And we want to make sure that when we're analyzing how a student solves a problem, um, that they have a true understanding. And that's important for our students in many ways. But most of the time, you will be doing fluency and conceptual. You'll be looking at those two areas. Like I said, procedural again. We want to know where the students are, uh, and we're going to look at applying that appropriate procedures. And many times that goes along with performing uh, non-computational skills, such as rounding or uh, ordering of numbers. Those are procedural skills that we'll be looking at. And the uh, Kentucky standards, our next thing that we're going to look at, is 
the fluency goals. Now I talked about this a little bit beforehand and these are where we are at. Again, fluency within 100 for third grade, but we also talked about oh, within 1,000 in third grade for adding and subtracting. But we also talk about the fact that multiplication becomes a part of it. Now, in fourth grade, we look at fluency using the algorithm. Like I said, that's where that part comes in, and the algorithm is basically just the regrouping. So fifth grade, we start looking at multiplying multi-digit whole numbers, and again, that's using the algorithm. And then sixth grade, we're looking at dividing. We're also looking at adding and subtraction, putting in decimals. And we're looking at writing, read, reading and writing and developing expressions. This is very hard for our students for expressions. And it's going to lead right into our algebra. So we want to make sure that our students understand those expressions and they understand what a letter stands for. That's really a hard concept for our students. It's like, You've been talking to me all this time about math and all of a sudden you threw in a uh, letter. Why is there a letter there? But go back and talk to the students about why there is that letter is there. And before you had a box in first grade or in second grade, you had a box there. So those are some things that we want to make sure that we're talking through. And then, of course, in algebra, if our students are working in algebra, they're going to look at how how do they write an expression. Uh, how do they look at opportunities to rewrite expressions and, of course, being able to find like terms, those kind of things, and then solving uh, quadratic equations with one variable. Here's a goal that we have, I'm trying to get through these because there's quite a few of, of them that I wanted to talk about. This is more for kindergarten, you'll see, first grade. And this is when given twin objects, JSON will count using one-to-one -one correspondence, 75% accuracy on four out of five trials as measured by teacher-created probes given every two weeks. Now, this is a curriculum measure. We know that. And this is one of the things that, um, and this would be a way to measure that. So if I'm looking at how could I measure this, I'm going to give the student objects, and this just basically says how we're going to do this. And we're going to repeat the process. And then down here, we're just going to mark an X uh, for each question, place an X if they, if, you know, if they didn't get it. If they didn't get it, how many did they get? What some notes that I can write? Again, as you can see, I'm writing some notes here because I want to know that student's thinking. I want to know, do they align them? Could it be an issue of the student doesn't understand why I just laid three objects out and they're in different places? at this point that they can pull them down and line them up in a row to count them. Do they do the little head bobbing thing? It looks like a little chicken pecking around. Do they try to do that and they just count in too many? Those kind of things are what I need to know so that I can teach maybe my student to organize. I can teach them to do the one-to-one -one and to make sure that they're touching it when they do count. Instead, they go one, two, three, four, five, six, and they've only got three objects. Those are the kind of things that I want to know during this. And so I'm going to go through and I'm going to put all of this in, into for my students so that they know this. And then of course, they're gonna get a percentage correct. During progress monitoring, at the beginning of this report, Jason was not making progress toward his goal. And we see that I gave the three uh, bench, uh, baselines. Uh, so I gave those and now I'm looking at them. And so the core team, uh, we, we discussed it. And we're adding an instructional strategy to keep using the Kathy Richardson activities where he's just going to be a ways of counting. And we'll talk about those Kathy Richardson activities and, and the books that you can get for those. Um, since that strategy began, he's increased his score to 65%. So we've, we've seen an increase. However, the last two recent data collections were shown he had a decrease. Now, this was due to, again, Jason's missed several days of school due to the flu. The strategy will continue being implemented and we're going to add now subitizing cards. So not only is he going to have the manipulatives, he's going to have a subitizing card. And I look at subitizing cards as a wonderful activity for our students when they're getting ready to count, but also what are they seeing? And so I can talk to them about comparing and contrasting. Sometimes we start out with subitizing cards having two different colors. Um, so that there's a, a good contrast for them, but we want them to always look at the fact of how many is there, so we, we may take the color coding away. And we talked about this, this is where he's at. 
I put a goal line up here. This is this goal line here just says this is where I want that student to be at 75%. Uh, the reason I do a goal line at the top so that we know where we're working toward all the time. Now here, of course, we talk about the aim line and the trend line. This is the aim line here and we've color coded wrong here. But anyway, the aim line is here. This is where we want him to be and he's exceeded that. And then of course his trend line we had started out, this is his actual, sorry, this is his trend line here, and this is his aim line. Well, he is actually above his aim line. So this has been color coded wrong on this. So this is just one way to do that. We wanna make sure that our data points are marked and how well he's doing. And as you can see, those are there. When given 10 three digit addition problems, now again, this is moving into third grade, if we were looking for a third grade student, or actually this may be a sixth grade student who's still working on those three digit addition problems, or even a fifth grade student, depending on where they're at, but this is around third grade. This can be used with a student, especially if we're starting to talk about that fifth grader who's having trouble with using um, decimals. This is a good place for that, for the, that student. Um, when given three digit addition problems with regrouping, Robert will accurately complete the problems with 70% accuracy. Now, and three out of five opportunities as demonstrated by Math Probes twice monthly. So this is the one here. If I'm looking at this, these are some probes that I could do. Now, if you notice, this is the probe that Robert's gonna get. This is the probe that I'm gonna be sitting there and I'm gonna be working on beside of him that I'm going to be writing what he's thinking. And this is notes for understanding. This is for me to have, this is his, this is for me to have those questions of, what are you thinking? Why are you doing this? Many times I may let the student go ahead and complete part of the probe before I actually start talking to them and I'm just writing down some things that they've got. If it makes the student nervous because I'm right there with them, I may have them to complete so many and then come talk to me. That's another way that you can do this. So all of this can be done with our students at any point. And like I said, I would probably make up 10 of these to make sure I had them and I would cycle back through them. Because many times students, they don't remember the exact problems that you, you're working on. And this may be a way. I could also throw in one at the very end that included the de decimal if I needed to, uh, because that's where they're working at. All right, so in this case, I just did some drawings about what was going on, where was he putting things. Um, he started working through the problem starting in the hundreds place because uh, that's what he was doing. Uh, when asked why he uh, started there, he noted that uh, he said, I already know what four plus four is length eight. And so he just went through and did this problem. Of course, this works because there's no regrouping at this point in time. Now, he is able to align the problems. So he draws the lines to make sure he's aligning the problems. And this may be a strategy that his teacher has talked to them about in using decimals. And so he's using it here. And then he completes the problem. On this one, he goes through, he's drawn the lines and he understands that four plus eight was 12. And he says, oh, I need to put the two here in the hundred spot and the one over Maybe he didn't say 100 spot. Maybe he just put down the 12. Those are things that I need to talk out with him to understand if he understands the place value. And if not, then that could be a problem. So he has a strategy. We know that. And so we can talk through those kind of things. So when I'm looking here, of course, like I said, this is where we want him to be at the very end. This right here is his trend line. And this is his aim line that we want him at. This is where he currently is working. All of these points here is where he's currently at. And so you can see those and where he, where he falls. Of course, we're gonna have that progress monitoring discussion with, with him about, you know, he's working on a third grade level. Even though this may be a student, like I said, who's in fifth grade. Um, that way we can talk about where he's currently at for his baseline was 35. We expected, you know, how is he supposed to be working through this? He's making progress toward his goal and he's on track. 
the instruction with the CSA model is there. Um, we began with base 10 blocks. We used explicit instruction. We did some modeling. And now modeling, when I think about explicit instruction, you guys have heard it, I know, a thousand times, but it's I do, we do, you do. It doesn't always fall like that. It may be I do, and then I do it again, having those conversations with the student because they're not understanding. And then it may be a we do together where they're talking through. And then again, we may have to do it again. And then we may have to do it again. So it may be a we do for several times before we move on to a you do. And then we may have to move back to a we do. So looking at explicit instruction and that modeling and how that's going to take uh, effect. And one of the big things um, that you'll notice is that explicit, direct, and systematic instruction are your strong suits for anything that you're going to do. It's where you have the most impact at, at any point with your students, but also it's where um, you're going to be able to see if you're doing explicit instruction, you're doing, it's very systematic. You're gonna see a very strong connection with your students at that point. So instructional changes were made on September 27th on this case to add a graphic organizer to separate the digits. Of course, it seems like he's doing pretty good with that. And then on October 25th, we did an instructional strategy using the Didax manipulatives. That's another area in which we, we could use. And so he's went through the CSA, a model, he's doing self-talk. So he's doing very well with those kind of things and we can see his progress with it. Now, and if we look back, as you can see, he is making improvements. Or if we can't tell the parent why he's making those improvements, but yet he's still not at goal, that's huge for our students. We want to have something that we're able to back up and see. All right, so our next student that we're gonna talk about, again, this is, a student that's probably somewhere in fifth, sixth grade, grade range, but they're probably working on problems that are somewhere around third grade. We need to be able to tell the parents, you know, yes, they're working on these types of problems. We're moving and we're making progress. No, they're not on grade level. And so this student's gonna do two-step math problems. He is going to identify the correct operation this is very hard for our students. And I know we talk about keywords, but also just understanding what that math problem is asking that student to do. So keywords are part of that, but if you're only teaching keywords, they're missing out on what's being asked in the problem. So we want them to be able to do this with 80% accuracy. Of course, four out of five opportunities, and we're gonna measure it twice monthly. This is a probe that we would be giving our students. We would be looking at, he would be working with this probe because it's 10 problems, just like it says, he's gonna work through those. I'm gonna identify, if I look back, here's a good example of scores and dates. If I look at this, where is he at? Currently, if I'm looking, these would be my three for my baseline. And so he's about 35 or 30, actually it'd be 37. So he's here and we expect him to be here. This is his trend line currently. He's had some times when he's not doing so well. So we can look at what that's gonna look like in the progress monitoring report. Um, and of course, he's taking a little bit of a dip. Now we've had some times when we've made growth and we're seeing that growth. Why are we having that growth? And so that's another area that we're going to look at. And this one, he was taught to use a graphic organizer to break down word problems. He was taught to use keywords. He shows little progress and in instructional changes. So we put in the CSA model and drawing out the progress uh, problems. Uh, he showed progress at this time on November 8th. He was not feeling well, was diagnosed with strep throat. There you go. I'm not feeling well, I'm not going to do well that day. Uh, instructional changes were made using the unravel strategy and some mnemonics. So we did those, he's making progress again. And we recently seen, uh, we seen before Christmas break that he was struggling with answering certain questions. Um, he ha was having to stay with his grandparents due to COVID. We all know this that kind of stuff happens and he was not taking his medication. So he went to stay with grandparents, not taking medication. We're gonna see a dip because guess what he's not doing now? If he's not paying attention, he's not getting that, the things he needs, he's fidgety, he's moving around. Continues on this path, he will meet goal by the end of the year. So this is one for high school. 
So when given an algebraic expression, it will simplify the expression, of course, 80% accuracy on twice monthly probes. Now, this is her progress that she's making. Uh, we can see this is her baseline. This is her aim line, and this is her current trend line. Now, does she look like she's going to be able to make progress? At the time, she's been right at it. So, yes, she's probably going to make progress for this goal and reach it if she keeps up. So, Kim is making progress, has seen improvements, and she was introduced to worked examples on November 10th. She's using algebra blocks with the CSA model in September for expressions. She's done color coding with the expressions in August, and now she is currently on track to meet her goal. So those are some things that we have done with her. And so she's currently on track. Some of the things, like I said, and we've got some examples here, she's used color coding. So she knows to use color codings to combine and she's able to do that. She's modeled using the algebra blocks. And so she has no problems with doing that. And then again, this right here is a good example of a worked example. If I'm looking at a worked example for my students, uh, it shows, you can see how it, it actually shows how they're supposed to combine. And they look at line one, and then we say, well, look at line two. What do you know about line two? What does that show? And so what's the difference between line one and line two? And they start to talk that out. Worked examples are very good for our students because they have something to go back to. Now, worked examples are different from working in example. A worked example is already complete for the student. They do not have to do anything to that. The answer's already there. They have to tell what's happening in the worked example. So that's huge for our students because again, if I have a student who has trouble comparing and contrasting, they're able to look at the worked example that they already have and they've talked through. They've talked through with the teacher, they've talked through with a partner at this point. Now they can do a problem very similar to it and come back to it. This is a wonderful strategy for our students. So having those strategies in place that students can have and they can use will help again to provide that, but also being making sure that when you do your progress monitoring that you put those things in place. Well, we've used worked examples. Sometimes we need to, parent will be like, well, what's a worked example? We'll have one out it's where you can talk to them. This is a running record, and I just kind of wanted to talk to you guys through this. If uh, Nikki Newton has running records, those are wonderful for us to use. In a running record, um, you can go to her site. We basically know what kind of strategy the student's using, where their instructional level is at, and we are able to say if it's automatic. There's a difference between fluency and automaticity. Automatic means I just know. I don't have to think about it. I know zero plus one is one. Uh, it's not something I have to think about. Fluency means I have a strategy. I may be thinking about it, but I can still do it quickly. With that, we're going to know if it's automatic. Did they wait five seconds, which means they have fluency, but prolonged means they have prolonged thinking time. And many of our students will have prolonged thinking time until they truly become fluent at something. So then do they have a strategy? Here's the strategies that my student may have. They may be counting all in this case. They may have counting on their fingers where they'll put one in their head and then count on, which, or they count it all in their head and you'll see them doing this little head bobbing thing again. That's another one of those count on. Um, they do the wrong operation. Maybe you've been adding some subtraction in with some of your instruction that you're doing and so now that's kind of first thing on their mind. So they do the wrong answer. Um, and they, you kind of know that if they say nine, uh, nine plus six and they go three, they're doing the wrong operation. Um, self-correcting, can they self-correct? Which now this leads to that, can I persevere through a problem? And then again, can I correct myself? Which means, you know, I'm doing some of those strategies in my head of estimating and those kind of things, we know that's not right. Because let's say I'm doing seven plus seven and I know seven and three more is 10. And maybe at that point in time, I said 11 
no seven plus three is 10, but seven plus seven is a lot more than that. So I need to not think about what that is. And so the student may do seven plus three, four more. Oh, that's 14. And so they'll say, no, no, that's not the right answer. And they'll self-correct them. Sometimes we don't provide enough wait time. Now that's that prolonged thinking time for our kids who really have to process. We may need to give them prolonged thinking time and they need to process that information. Now, I know that's one of the things I really had to work on was wait time. I tend to uh, want to help my students out and that's not helping them in mathematics. So giving them that chance to really think. Uh, Miss Wanda used to tell a little story about a little girl in her classroom. And I thought this is such a great story for, for prolonged thinking time is she said she was getting ready to give the student the answer and she stuck her little finger right up in her face like, no, one more minute. Um, and she said, they sit there, even though it was time to go and we all know how we are when we're on schedule. She was like, nope, one more minute, give me a minute. And she got to the right answer. But we would not have known if she had the right answer had she not been kind of forceful about it. Like, give me one more minute. Uh, to get that. So we want to make sure that they can do that. Of course, they attempt to self-correct. That's another thing. They know they've got the right, wrong answer. They attempt to self-correct. They may not still get the right answer, but what's the strategy they're using? And so we want to be able to do that. And then, of course, they just didn't know. Maybe they didn't try. But again, they may try several things and they still don't know. So making sure they have a strategy in place. Of course, if you look at the strategy levels that we have over here, you've got they don't know. That's zero, right? I mean, they don't know. They may have counting strategies by ones. They may be able to make, even count by twos. They may use their fingers. They may draw little circles. They may draw little sticks, those kind of things. That's, that's pretty much a level one. Uh, they may use manipulatives. Uh, they may have a level two, which is mental math in their head. They have some uh, strategies to go on. Like I said, with the seven plus seven, they go seven plus three is 10. I got four more, that's 14. They've got some strategies there. And then of course we get into a level four, which is, it's pretty much, they've got the strategy, it's automatic. Um, they're, ha they're not having any pro problems, they can recall it and they understand how the numbers work. Um, but then of course they've mastered, it means it's automatically and it's recalled from memory. These are wonderful ways to be able to look for our students and a great way if you're doing addition subtraction multiplication because uh, she already has a lot of these on her website that you can just go and pull. Now, another one I've talked about Kathy Richardson. She has several of these all the way up through about fifth grade that you can use these. These are uh, the wonderful assessing math concepts. If you've got some money in your district, these are great ways for you to be able to assess your students. They come with this wonderful uh, testing with them and you can make uh, you can use these this one of course that we're doing two digit it talks about are they using tens are they doing um choosing appropriate uh columns are they not do they understand the place value it's a quick easy assessment to do doesn't take very long with your students but it, it's definitely broken down into the areas in which they're talking about like i said they've got different ones and up through about fifth grade that you can use these. In Infinite Campus, and I talked to Ms. Brenda about this earlier, I said many of our, our districts are using Infinite Campus. So if you go to um, KDE's website, you will find this goal monitoring in Infinite Campus, and it's Ashley Cook and Jessica Jones, and they'll walk you through what that looks like. That's another way that you can do this. You can also access the slides for Infinite Campus here, so this is their slides in Infinite Campus on how to talk about the data. They've got that. They've got key features that you're going to look for. They've got setting up your goals, where do you need to go to, goal monitoring, how you need to do that. And so this is a great one. If you haven't done this yet, this is a wonderful way to get in there for your Infinite Campus and go ahead and set these up. They're very step-by-step. -step. You may want to print this off. That's what I would do is print this off and I would make sure I was going through it step-by-step step for each one. And the great thing about, of course, logging in the data, it tells you how, how you can log in the data. And remember, we monitor the goal. Um, 
and not the objectives. So there's that. Uh, and then you can preview, uh, preview your graph and it will do your graph for you. That's the great thing about it. It will actually do your graph for you. It's got your data, it's got your trend line already on your Infinite Campus graph. And then of course, all your comments that you've put in is there too. So this Stephanie, will print it off. Stephanie, this is Dion. So there is a link and there is a training that goes along with that on KDE's website. All right, some resources that I wanted you to have and uh, the capability of seeing uh, today. Progress monitoring tools, of course, is in here. Um, you're going to see progress monitoring tools. I'll just quickly go into a couple of these. This is a wonderful little thing for progress monitoring tools for mathematics and for reading and for writing. So there's some here that you will see and for social emotional. So this was created by our wonderful task groups. And then it goes into, and like I said, I'm moving through these really quickly, but you can see some progress monitoring tools here for you and some resources that you can have. The other one is scoring computational. This one is from the Iris Center. And I love the fact that it goes into how to score for progress monitoring and those kind of things. This is make it count, uh, providing feedback for those formative assessments. I cannot say enough about how important feedback is. And John O'Connor probably said it back best. He said, students need the chance to have multiple opportunities to share their understanding, but they also need corrective feedback for it. So, and it needs to be pretty much immediate for our students. They need to have that immediate corrective feedback. Um, early elementary, this is another one. This talks about the CSA model and Anybody who's heard me talk knows that the CSA model is extremely important for our students. So this gives you some black line masteries for interventions. And these come from, again, the Kathy Richardson activities. So I love those. They're perfect for our students, especially when they're developing that number sense. Um, trying to figure out math assessment probes. This is all about math assessment probes. It talks about conceptual and about procedural. It talks about the type of probes that you may want to give to your students, common errors that you're going to see, those kind of things. Like I said, this is a lot of information. I know all at one time. And then of course, data recording sheets, different types of data recording sheets that you can use. Now, if you're putting all of this in Infinite Campus, you know, you probably want to keep a working folder for your students so that they have these, but these are all types of IEP goal sheets that you can access. And then, of course, you have intervention programs that you can look at for our students if you're looking at different ones that you may want to use, and this is for middle grades. And then, of course, KDE's compliance for progress monitoring. Here is where you can access those KDE compliance documents. There's a couple of books I do want to talk about today. Again, I've talked about running records and how you can use those. This is for K-5. So if you can see my little video here, this is Math Running Records in Action it is a framework for assessing basic fact fluencies. This is wonderful. Like I said, this is Nikki Newton's book. I'm not promoting anything, but if you're going to do running records, this is a wonderful way in mathematics. We know and we've seen running records work with reading recovery. This is very similar to that. She's taken the same strategies uh, that they used, except for converted it over to mathematics. And this is a great way to get yourself started if you're going to really understand where that student's at. The other book that I like is Putting Practices into Action. This book is Susan O'Connell. She does a wonderful job with the practices and understanding what those practices mean in mathematics. Another great book, great reading, real thin uh, book also, doesn't take very long. Uh, another book that you may want to look at is Routines for Reasoning. 
And this one is fostering those mathematical practices. Again, not just the teaching practices, but the practices for students. This is a wonderful way for our students. This one is around K-8, but can really be used for all grades. This one here is for all grades, uh, all students. A wonderful activities inside the book. Talks about step-by-step -step on think time and individual th think time, how to sh uh, have students to share, representations that need to be done for our students and everything like that. Like I said, this is a wonderful, wonderful way for our students to be able to uh, understand those kind of things. If you have any questions for me, my name again is Stephanie Kidd at The Holler. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I was just going to jump in real quick and say that if you have questions or follow up information, you can get in contact with Stephanie. So she is our math consultant. So any math support resources that you might need, she is the person to get in contact with. So we're going to just make sure I brought you all back to um, that email. 